There is about 11 million undocumented immigrants. If we were able to find a way to have a pathway for them to start paying taxes, for them to start feeling like they're a part of society and they don't have to hide, this could have $121 billion impact. Carlos Alfarlo is the Arizona State Director at the American Business Immigration Coalition dedicated to supporting immigration reform initiatives through private sector leadership and public policy. I think we all recognize the need to fix our immigration system for the benefit of our country, for the benefit of our citizens and our economy, but really also um, for people to fulfill the American dream. This has been a dream that's happened for hundreds of years. The idea that somebody can come, work hard, pay their taxes and help and give back to their community, that's what America is all about. Today, we'll sit down with Carlos to hear his thoughts on immigration and how he thinks we can fix some of the problems we're seeing today. But before we chat with Carlos, let's sit down with our panel of game changers to see their perspective on immigration. I'm kind of curious to see if they find immigration one of the top issues moving forward. So let's dive right into today's American Game Changer. So I want to welcome to the show Manu Mills with Bridge USA and Marcus Alata with Cal State Fullerton. My question for you guys is today is there's a lot in the news about immigration. Um, there's a lot going on, on our southern border. Uh, my personal stance is that, you know, I hear the stories, I hear, I've heard about the cartels, I'm bringing people over, and it's just a very sad thing to see, I feel like. Seeing these, these immigrants and seeing them wanting to come here, there's a reason behind that. Um, but I also feel like we can't just have a free-for-all. We can't just have it where everyone, you just, millions and millions of people just become U.S. citizens overnight. Um, I don't think that's a economically good. I don't know if that's logistically sound. Um, I just don't know if that makes a lot of sense in my eyes. So my question to you guys is, as the next generation of voters, is immigration a really big deal to you guys? Is what's happening on the border, do you really think it's gonna impact you guys for the future? Let's start with you, Marcus. Yeah, so I can tell you uh, very easily that the border is probably in the top three things that I am very concerned about. It's not only the uh, factor of people and migrants, um, but also crime um, and drugs. Um, we are seeing an open border where anyone can come in unchecked. We have record high migrant contacts. We have record high drug overdoses, especially with fentanyl, um, record high seizures, and that's only what we're catching. So we know that the uptake in drug drugs coming into America, there's more people coming in. Yeah, it is a very heavy concern, and it's not because there's a lack of love for these people and the understanding that America is a land of opportunity and the right people should be able to come here. Um, I am very strongly for building the wall, but also fixing the door, for lack of better terms, and reforming legal immigration policy and procedures. But this open border is catastrophic and it's dangerous to not only our current uh, society, but futures down the road. It's extremely dangerous and it's a top concern for me. Mono, your response. You know, what's interesting about this conversation, Nick, like every other policy conversation is that we always talk in talking points that have been set by political leaders that are pushing certain narratives. I want to get out of that for a quick second. We have Bridge USA chapters in Arizona, in Texas, specifically at UT El Paso, where 40% of the students actually come from Juarez every day through the border to go to school. We have chapters at UT Austin, at St. Edwards University. Then we have chapters in Louisiana that are very close to the Texas border. So we have students having these conversations across the board. And I can say one thing, which is that every person we've spoken to, left, right, middle, blue, green, purple, is that almost everyone recognizes the fact that this country was built on immigrants that immigration has been the ethos of this country. The question now becomes, how do we continue that ethos with the reality of today? And so there's three tiers to this question for us and for me specifically. The first tier is how do you deal with the people that are already in the U.S. as illegal immigrants because maybe they were brought here as children or they were brought here by family members and they didn't have a choice in this process. I think there's actually widespread agreement on what to do with those people um, across the board, from people on the right, like Dan Crenshaw, to people on the left, like Bernie Sanders. People have generally agreed that when it comes to students and people that are brought here illegally and didn't have a choice in that matter, that we should probably allow for a way for them to normalize in society. 
The second tier, which Marcos briefly mentioned, was your uh, 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 legal migrants and immigrants. So people that are coming from pe- places like India, China, you know, Europe, even people that are coming from Central America, but legally. Now, I think most people also agree that those folks are really important because one, we're actually taking the smartest people from other countries and supplying them to the U.S. And second is that they get a competitive edge because they take American culture and Western values back to their countries, which is something that no one actually talks about, but is a huge value add. It is the way that we maintain our soft power across the world. Most people think that that process needs to be effective, important, and maybe even sped up. Now, what Marcos talked about, the question of the open border, is I think where there's the most disagreement on this question, which is what do you do about it? So I think that most people, again, on the left uh, and on the liberal side of the question, do believe that if you cross the border illegally, you should be arrested. This is where the problem in our politics comes from, is that we have leadership and politicians that push certain narratives and then other politicians counter those narratives. And then what we have is that the average everyday person that has sensible ideas is never represented. And so when you think of what a person in the Democratic Party would say about illegal migrants, you're probably going to think they want to normalize them, they want to take your job, and they don't care about your security. So that's what I want to start tackling in these sorts of conversations, is bring nuance into the process. Because there's widespread agreement on this issue. Uh, and we're letting a tenth of the immigration debate prevent us from making any progress in the other 90%. I, I agree. There is very little nuance um... In, in regards to this, I actually heard a very interesting thing from Tulsi Gabbard one time where she basically, she was on a podcast and she mentioned how you want security at the border, but you also want to be able to have a good way, pathway to citizenship. You want to almost have the both. And somehow it seems like both sides of it say we can only have secure border first before pathway. And the other one says we have to have a pathway before we can have secure border. Um, is there any way of finding solution? Marcos, what's your thoughts? Yeah, well, first of all, I think we should encourage legal immigration and reform that, like I said, fix the door so people can come in more effectively and uh, more correctly instead of having like jeopardy and these, like it's up to chances, right? Um, and we can fix the problem by ending the rhetoric because I know you said the normal people don't, you know, agree with those that are in power, but those in power are the ones making decisions and making it worse. Biden campaigned on immigration reform, and early in the days when he was actually pre- became president. People were showing up to the border, openly admitting to Border Patrol agents that they were there because Biden said it was going to be okay, right? And they are pushing that rhetoric that it's okay to come here. And they're pushing welfare in California. We gave them their own stimulus check that cost millions of dollars of the American taxpayer money, my taxpayer money, as a California citizen. They want to talk about reparations, about giving 450000 to immigrants who were separated from their families, even though U.S. service members only get 400000 and they have to pay for it if they die. So the rhetoric is there enabling and encouraging immigration. So if we want to actually reform immigration, we should talk about that. But the fact is our leaders aren't. So everyday Americans might be talking about, okay, well, we need to fix immigration so people can come here correctly. And that's where I think uh, we all agree. Like Manu said, most people would agree. But those in charge aren't. And we have to address those issues sternly because now we have people dying every five minutes from fentanyl. We have records highs over and over and over daily. I think we're up to like 221,000 migrants in um, contacts in March, which is not counting the gotaways. So you can't just ignore the problem and say, well, there has to be nuances and stuff when there's the broad picture and the rhetoric that's enabling and welcoming illegal immigration and leading to people dying from either the drug overdoses from open borders, which is what we're talking about. It's the border crisis, not necessarily immigration reform, right? Those open borders are killing people, right? I mean, in 2000, I think 19 to 20, 94% 94% uh, of teens were dying from fentanyl. Go, it went up 94%. And then the years after that, it went up an additional 20%. And if we get one kilo of fentanyl, it has the potential of killing 500,000 people in America. And there's already enough fentanyl in America to give every single American one lethal dose of fentanyl. Well, the, the topic in general is immigration. So, you know, it, entire, you know, the border as well. So it sounds to me like, Marcos, that you are very much the, the security of the border must come first before the pathway stuff. I would say no, because if, if we just have, if we just close the border, it's not going to solve a lot of the problems like Manu said. That's why I, I led with, we need to fix and reform the system. I'm not sure what's the best way forward to do so, but we know the system is broken now. And there needs yeah. to be a more bipartisan approach on how to fix it. But you, we have to fix that border first with the open border crisis. 
You also mentioned, Marcos, that the rhetoric, you know, from the current administration isn't, you know, isn't the best. You had some criticism of that. What's your thoughts? Is the administration and what they're doing right now, Manu, is the rhetoric there or is it just the partisan stuff that we usually hear? Well, I'm not here to defend the administration, but I just say that I looked at my phone uh, to Google what was the arrest at the southern border in the last month. There's 1.9 million people got arrested at the southern border in the last month. To me, that's not an open border. That's a that's a question of 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 us weaponizing an issue for a political gain. Let me be very clear. The reason why it's a question of whether you want a pathway first or security first is an irrelevant question. The reason why that exists is because one party needs to make the case that they're for immigration before they can make the case for security. And the other side needs to make the case for security before they can make the case for immigration. Because we've dug ourselves in a hole where any position you hold is an existential crisis. There is no reason in this country why you can't build a wall and also reform the process. We, we have a military industrial complex where we send thousands of troops to war. We have 195 forward operating bases abroad. We've built the most diverse country in the history of Mandy, and you're telling me we can't build a border wall and also reform immigration? Now, I'm not for a wall necessarily, but again, this is the problem in our politics. What Marcos is saying is, is very accurate in that you're right that I can pick on rhetoric, but there are real problems with the border. But we have to start chipping away at the fact that when you say fentanyl deaths happen because there's an open border, well, let's interrogate that. An open border implies that you're not having 1.9 million arrests. There's approximately 2 million people that cross over the border, which means we're arresting approximately 56.5% of the people walking through. The second point about fentanyl deaths, how long does it take for heroin to get from the Texas southern border to Kentucky? Well, if you're using meals and you're using transportation, it's probably going to take about a month and a half. You add a couple more weeks on that to sell it. What that means is that the fentanyl that just crossed the border last month is going to show up in two months. People are still dying that interim period. The reason why they're dying is not just because of the open border, but complex issues throughout Appalachia that demonstrate that those communities are struggling. So again, the reason why I went through that was not to obfuscate the fact that we need to solve real issues where people are dying. It's to recognize that if we operate in the policy points that President Trump has set up or the Biden administration set up, we're not going to get anywhere. I think there's something that we can both agree on in some senses is that, you know, our politicians in general have been failing us on this issue and there needs to be a new approach. There needs to be a more nuanced approach. Um, I, I think that that's something that we can all agree on right there. Thank you guys so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Uh, hope to see you guys on soon. Yeah, good seeing you guys. Thanks, Nick. Nice seeing you again, Marcos. Likewise. So now I'm here with Carlos Alfaro. You know, one of the reasons I want to have you on is because you've been working on immigration, you've been involved in politics, you've done referendums, you've been involved in a lot of different things. And, you know, I just had my panel on. And the first question I asked them is, as next generation voters, why is immigration so important to them? Or is it important to them? Um, what's your answer? Is immigration important to the next generation of voters? Absolutely. I mean, when you look at polls up and down the spectrum, whether it be Republican, Democrat, Independent, uh, older voters, younger voters, I think we all recognize the importance that immigration has to our country and the importance to actually having sensible solutions, right? Um, I don't think anybody out there would say that our immigration system is working just great and that there needs to be no fixes. I think we all recognize the need to fix our immigration system for the benefit of our country, for the benefit of our citizens and our economy, but really also um, uh, to, for people to fulfill the American dream. This has been a dream that's happened for hundreds of years. Um, the idea that somebody can come work hard, pay their taxes and help uh, and give back to their community. That's what America is all about. And so that's, I think, the reason why uh, immigration is uh, of utmost importance to the new generation of voters. One thing that I brought up, I kind of brought my personal stance and kind of like how I think about it. For me, it's very much like I hear the plight of immigrants and I hear, you know, they want to come to the shining beacon, which is America, you know. Our country is one of the greatest countries in the world. And I hear it and I see it and I feel so much sympathy. I hear, I see the stories of the cartel uh, and the coyotes sneaking people in. There's a reason behind that, you know. There's a reason why people would go through all that to get to our country. But I also don't know if it's a smart idea 
just to open things up have it just everyone across is just uh, U.S. citizens. I don't know if economically that's good. I don't know if logistically that makes sense. So I guess my question is, is there a solution to this problem? Is there a way where you can almost have security at the border, but also a pathway to citizenship? Do those two things even, can you even have those two things? <laughs> I, I think so. I think so. And most of us agree with that. Again, uh, looking back at polling, but also looking back at dinner, conversations and, and friendship conversations. You know, we talk about uh, the common sense solutions more than the politicians do, more than the media does. And that's because I think most voters, most Americans uh, see the, the fixes that have to be done. You're completely right on the security side uh, where we need to have an orderly system. We need to have security. Uh, we need to ensure that our people are safe. And so I think most of us agree with that. Um, and I also agree with your second point that there needs to be an orderly system. You know, when you pull Republicans and Democrats, conservatives, liberals, um, even just looking at Trump and Biden voters, uh, the majority of support uh, comes for fixing these things, especially for undocumented immigrants who have uh, earned the rightful path to citizenship. Right. So this is about earning it. This is about doing it the right way. And then the country allowing for the right way to exist. For many, many people in our country, the right way does, just simply does not exist. There is no line to stand in to do it the right way. And so we can argue about the more controversial uh, issues of how many people we should allow in, what, what the process is now. But at the very least, I think we can all agree that we should make um, an orderly process that everyone has access to, um, to at least do it the right way, right? And not, not to push towards illegal immigration. I think you, I agree. And it's like, we want an orderly process. We want common sense at the border. But it seems like what we get is politicians on both sides. And something I brought up with the panel, too, is, you know, we have politicians basically once say, I'm not budging unless we get a pathway to citizenship down proposal. And then we have some people that say, I'm not budging unless we get a secure border down. So, you know, is there ever going to be headway? Do you have faith that in our lifetimes, that we could see a fix or a solution to immigration in our border. Absolutely. And this this is not because it's going to happen because of the political will, right? As you mentioned, politicians use this almost like a bargaining chip that never gets played. Um, and it's mostly an, an excuse to say no to certain things. And so as we see the pressure on our economy, the benefits that we get from immigrants all across the world contributing to our economy, you know, um, and how much it would add, that's going to push us forward. You know, when it comes to businesses acquiring the right labor, when it comes to getting people of high skill, doctors, um, lawyers, um, you know, people of high skill into our country, that's when the rubber meets the pavement. And that's where um, I think it's the solutions are. So um, we have a big problem here in having people that are kind of living in the in the gray area that they don't know whether it's they're legal or not and they don't know where to go and that has a big impact on our economy i mean most people think there's about 11 million undocumented immigrants uh if we were able to find a way to to have a pathway for them to start paying taxes for them to start feeling like they're a part of society and they don't have to hide this could have um one uh, $121 billion impact, according to some of the um, economic impact studies that we've seen. Um, all of that money coming into our economy, producing productivity for our employers, and um, really think about the lives that would be changed, no longer to have to be hiding uh, in order to go to work, in order to pay your taxes, in order to drive down the street. And so I think no matter where we're on the spectrum, we agree on the end goal. It's just getting there. And I think the biggest motivator, the, the reason why I think there's a lot of hope is we see business leaders, uh, we see companies come out and uh, actually support some of these proposals. And I think that um, that is newer than ever before, you know, as more and more businesses start feeling the, the pressure of getting more labor and more skilled work, um, they're going to start backing some, some good legislation and hopefully having that influence on the politicians themselves. Very interesting. You mentioned um, the economic side of things and being able, you know, you said there's maybe 11 million or so illegal immigrants that, you know, that could be paying taxes. I think that what I hear and what people fear is that if you allow and just open it up, that a lot of the jobs 
the low earning jobs um, will be taken away um, and taken away from citizens that have been here before, that have been, that are here. What is your thought on losing jobs to immigrants and that concern by Americans? Um, I think it's a fair concern. I, I think that the concern um, uh, is more towards the, the shortage that we have. It's not that we um, can account for some people coming in. In fact, I don't think anybody is really pushing for, um, at least in, uh, nobody that's serious in the immigration community is pushing for a free for all, like let's not even look at uh, people coming in. Obviously we need that orderly process, but I would argue that we are having the opposite problem of not having enough workers for the jobs that are available. Now this shifts and it goes up and down depending on the economy. Uh, but currently we're going through inflation. We're going through labor shortages. And one of the best ways to get through that is to import and export labor, just like we do with goods, right? When you up things like tariffs and restrictions, it, it becomes more expensive and it almost impossible for goods to flow in and out easily. We have to do the same for labor, uh, an orderly process so that we know who's coming in um, and an orderly process so that we can fulfill this labor shortage. So my answer to that is that um, we need all the workers we can get, especially those um, high skilled workers that make our country better. Absolutely. If we can somehow maintain, like what you were saying, our doctors, our lawyers, and yeah, figure out a way, I, I don't see what the issue. One of the things that I would like to bring up is, again, going kind of back to solutions and fixing this. And, you know, we both, I think, want the common sense, orderly way of doing this. Um, is money the issue? Is it that we're not putting enough money towards this? Do we need more administrators there? Do we need more border security? Uh, guards, in a sense. And then some people say, okay, we need the administrative side, the pathway side. What do we need to make this happen? I think we have the answer right in our hands. It's what makes uh, America so great. And that's the, the fact that we um, are a more capitalistic country, right? We go through supply and demand. The market operates in a more free environment here. And I would argue that we can use that to our advantage in this issue as well. Um, we have a big problem of people coming in, um, maybe undocumented, maybe uh, not through the legal pathways, um, but we need to be able to separate people that are here, that are trying to do harm, uh, are coming in for criminal purposes, and those that are just trying to come in for refugee purposes or even uh, working purposes. The best way to do that is to have a open legal system that allows for us to review those cases to, to actually view so that there is not an overflow of, of line. And therefore, if, if people that are looking for work and refuge go through the right pathways, if we create a line for them, then the only people that would be crossing illegally would be those that are trying to commit harm, uh, the, the ones that are trying to go around the law to do this. I think we need to separate those groups of people and use supply and demand um, as, as a help. If, if we see a labor shortage here, we should increase the amount of people that we want to bring in legally through the right way, uh, through, with all the background checks that we need. But we really need that system to work. At the moment, I think it's overflowing to the point where you really can't tell the people that are coming in, uh, whether they're here to do good, they're here to do uh, sketchy things. And so that's one of the things that I would say we need, yes, more money, more budgeting. Uh, we, yes, absolutely. We need enforcement, but more than that, we need a, a system that actually processes mm -hmm. people at the right, at the right sense. We need to separate um, people that are trying to do good from those that are bad. And I would argue that most people that are coming in um, are trying to either do good for them and their families and also give back to yeah. our country. I, I see when you when I listen to that, that's just common sense, right? Like we should be having a line, right? It just makes <laughs> sense to be doing something like that. So it kind of leads into my next question in a sense is like, so I give you the magic wand. Um, you're in complete control of immigration um, in this country. What is the very first thing that you want to do right away if you had the power to? I think we must look at our business community, the business community, the ones that are actually working with labor and goods. They're the ones that should be leading this. So instead of having some centrally controlled uh, arbitrary number and this is how much we're going to allow and that's it. I think we should go more towards the entrepreneurial, the free market model of saying how many people do we need in this particular industry? Uh, how many people uh, would we like uh, in the high labor skill to come here and make their lives here and, and, and promote our 
um, our way of life. Um, and so I would get rid of those restrictions that make it hard for people to apply. You know, there, there's so many examples, right, of people waiting years, whether they have a pathway through their family members or their new spouse or something. And these people are here, they're contributing not only in their tax dollars, but in their labor, in their work. And so um, I would cut the times that the time to get your case figured out, that should be, um, in my opinion, almost immediate, right? Mm -hmm. Having the right background checks. We do it at airports. You know, we do it with certain checks. We've experienced some of this through um, COVID, where we had to kind of verify our vaccination records and all of this. So if we can do it for something like that, uh, I think we can do it for something as important as our immigration system. If I had the keys to it, I would hand it over and uh, let our business leaders um, lead on this and let the market really drive immigration. It is um, almost like something uh, that we have that's an advantage to our country that so many people want to come here Mm -hmm. and be free and start their businesses that instead of seeing it as a problem, instead of seeing, oh man, how can we you know, get away from this, we should encourage and see how how can we get uh, more economic activity for this? How can we get more safety from immigration? So these are the right kinds of questions and the right shift that we must make uh, when talking about these issues is the advantages of immigration and not just the disadvantages. We are in a capitalistic country, right? You know, capitalism is is what we, you know, is everything that builds our system. So, you know, I, I kind of like that, you know, the idea of that we can use our businesses in a way to really kind of entice and figure out a way to put pressure. They, I think the business community in so many different areas could stand up for a lot of different things um, that maybe they should, they haven't. I wanted to ask you, one of the things is, is, you know, this is a serious topic. I mean, this is a very big deal um, and to so many people why did you get involved in immigration? Why are you passionate uh, about this topic? So I have a lot of reasons, right? I mean, politically smart. I, I think that, you know, for the people that care about personal freedom and free markets, uh, I think that um, it's politically smart for us to support uh, the advantages of immigration. I think it's um, economically smart. It drives business. It drives productivity. It creates more goods and services that we can take a part of and and benefit from. But I really think it's the moral side that drives me to this issue. I myself am an immigrant. I was born in Mexico uh, with my family. We decided to come here to Arizona, to Phoenix, because we saw it as a fantastic state uh, to go to school, a fantastic state to open a business um, and be in community with others. We had the wonderful opportunity to do that. And um You know, I see my peers do the same thing and I see them give back to their community, whether they went to university and now they're attorneys, they're lawyers, they are business owners um, or even just started their own family here. Uh, And that adds to our our um, our community and our American experience. So for me, it's morally right. For me, it's morally right for us to as a country recognize the benefits of immigration and really fix a problem that um, is common sense and not let politics sleep in there and and try to mess things up like they have in the past. So the more people that are having the conversation this way, the closer we are to actually solving the problem. And I'm, I'm happy to see that uh, happen with a lot of um, business owners and political leaders through ABIC. Yeah. Going back to you personally a little bit, do you plan on uh, being a part of this battle, this immigration and fighting for immigration? You know, is this something that you plan on being a part of for the long haul? Absolutely. I mean, I I have friends and colleagues uh, both on the left and the right that as the years go by, as we look at um, immigration proposals happening at the federal and state levels, uh, we feel compelled to uh, to be involved and to be a voice of reason in this very, very tenacious issue. Uh, at the end of the day, when you have a good conversation and when you are fair to one another and want to actually solve the issue, it really becomes common sense. It becomes common sense and easy to pass these, these solutions. So right now, what we're working on is building that might of business owners, of nonprofit leaders, of uh, political leaders that are willing to take that conversation and put it into action. Absolutely. So my final question for you, and I like to ask this to everyone that comes on uh, my show, and and that's a question of hope. Is there hope for immigration in the future? Is there something to really look forward to? I mean, what is your message of hope? 
We have a great future in this country in the sense that we are importing knowledge, we're importing skills, and we're importing characters into our great country. Uh, most people that, like myself, that come here are just astounded by this great system of government and economy. And I think that that is the message of hope. Um, seeing people coming from other places as friends because they want to be here. They want to, they want to work and, and make this country just as, as better as before. And so I think this is the history of America. We're always changing. We're always growing. We're always adding new things to our free country. And so the message of hope is whether legislation passes today or next year or 10 years from now, our country is going to be better for it because we have more people, more skills and more economic power. Carlos, thank you so much for joining American Game Changers. I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much for your invitation, Nick.